This is the Vic Fazell Show podcast, hosted by Vic Fazell and Jonathan Zimmick. Sponsored by Moroso Wood Fired Pizza, Pinewood Coffee Bar, and the Law Offices of Vic Fazell. Hugh, I'm so excited to be here with you today. Uh, get to hear you tell your observations about not only Henry Lee Lucas, but we're going to be talking about Ted Bundy and about your involvement with the uh, coverage of the John Kennedy assassination. You were actually a witness to that, weren't you? Yeah. Wow. Well, I actually didn't see the president, but had I looked up at 2 o'clock, I could have seen Oswald in the window. So you were in the center of the street there. That was a hectic day. Tell us what you were doing back then. What what brought you there? I was the uh, science and space editor for the Dallas Morning News, and I covered all the space flights all during that decade. And I didn't. I had an interview at SMU with some space scientist. Don't recall who. Certainly didn't show up. And I decided at the last minute almost that I was only four blocks from where he w- would be passing, and that everybody you know, ought to go see the president. So I hightailed it over. The uh, crowds were vociferous. They were three and four, and six and seven deep. And so I had to keep going. And I saw a couple of lawyers that I knew, and I sort of followed them over to uh, the Elm Street. And that's where I stood center of Elm Street, and I looked up at the window. I could have seen him. I didn't, of course. Cause the so Kennedy, you could have seen Lee Harvey. Yeah. Lee Harvey Oswald. I was watching uh, the, the Kennedys had just passed me, but it was about four cars later, and I heard the shots. And uh, I wasn't sure the first one I thought was a car backfiring, but then there were two others. And I I knew there were shots. So I didn't know what to do, really, because I I had no pencil or paper. I'd just gone over there to see the motorcade. I saw a little boy just close to me. His daddy was holding him, and he had one of these big old pens on on a pencil or other, and, and a little flag. And I just took it from him, gave him two quarters, and took off, knowing that I had to find someone to talk to. So you were actually there and heard the shots? Heard the shots. You thought the first one was a back. We didn't know where in the world they were coming from. And I saw this man pointing up to the window, right across the street. So I ran to him, and he was the one that described Oswald. Saw him, he was sitting on a parapet there, and right across the street he saw him, and he uh, described him perfectly. And then when he found out I was with the Dallas News, he said, he oh, get away, get away. He was scared for his family, he said. Later we became friends, but he was afraid for his family. Wow. So two cops pushed me away from him. Well, that was lucky, too, because then I started interviewing other people. Nobody knew what had happened, really. They saw the damn car speed off, and nobody knew. But... On the, on the motorcycle radio came the report from Oak Cliff a few minutes later. Officer been shot, I think it's bad, or something of that sort. So I said to myself, you know, if someone shoots at the president here, and we didn't know his condition, whether he'd been hit or not, but if someone shoots at the president, and then someone shoots a cop three or four miles away, there's a chance it could be connected. So I, my car was four blocks back to news. I didn't have a way to get to Oak Cliff. So I ran into two Channel 8 guys that had a mobile unit. And I said, did you hear what just came over the radio? And he said, no, no, what? And I said, cop killed over in, in three or four miles over in Oak Cliff. They said, come on. And we, the three of us, went like wild to Oak Cliff got there in time to see 
the woman that had seen him up close, two sisters who'd seen him. And, and by him, you mean Lee Harvey Oswald? Yeah. Yeah. And so that was that was an interesting afternoon. And we went, we searched through buildings, three or four of them, and finally, I remember going into an old furniture store. It wasn't a sales place; it was a storage facility for old furniture. And they thought they had a report that whoever it was was in there. So we go in there. I'm going in there. I'm up the steps. And I look around and I, I know some of these cops, eight or nine, ten cops, and me. They all got guns and I don't. Oh my. Well, I was a little going into a little the place. hesitant. Yeah. yeah. Then we get inside the door and almost immediately a guy, one of the cops that had been there earlier from the back, fell halfway through the floor. And everybody had their guns out. It's a wonder they didn't shoot him. And at that point I say, look. I'm getting out of here. <laughs> Everybody here's got a gun. I don't have a gun, and I'm scared to death. So went outside, and luck was with me again. I went up to an FBI guy I knew he was sitting in his car, his radio on, and he was getting a report that there was a suspect in the Texas theater. Texas theater. And so I thought, geez, that's. I hadn't eaten breakfast that morning. I was hungry. I drank a lot of coffee. I was I was almost weak. I thought I gotta go, but it's eight or nine blocks. So I went eight or nine blocks, and I remember going in, going up to the woman selling tickets. Her name was Julia Postel. Postel, and I said, and he, "He's in there. He's in there." She said. And I said, did he buy a ticket? Stupidest thing I <laughs> ever asked. And she said, no, no, you don't understand. He's in there. So about that time, I ran into a, a guy who was manager of the shoe store. His name was Johnny Brewer. And Brewer was the reason that Oswald got cut. Because he was alone in his shoe store, four doors down from the theater. And he saw every time the police cars, they were, wow, they were going, you know, crazy. Every time one went by, Oswald would sort of hide in into the recesses in front of his store. So he ran up, and he's the one that told him he thought this was an, somebody involved. So I go inside the theater with Johnny Brewer. And, and there are no cops around yet? Oh, yeah, there were oh, cops. Oh, there were cops there. there. Were cops oh, here. good. Yeah, there were a lot of cops there. And I didn't see them all because most of them went in the back, came out on the stage. They had stopped. They had turned the lights semi on. And there were only about 13, 14 people in the theater at the time. And I went uh, first to the far door, looked in, because there were more people sitting over there. No activity at all. And then I saw people coming off the stage. Two or three cops, guns drawn. And one of them stopped just before they got to where Oswald was. And uh, by that time I'd moved down to this door. I was about 15 feet from Oswald when they jumped on him. Now this cop, Nick McDonald was real smart. He stopped and talked to a couple, three or four seats in front of Oswald. Probably saved himself from getting shot. Anyway, he jumped on him. Immediately, cops came from all directions. And it was just like one of these things you used to see in a comic book where an arm here and a leg there, <laughs> everybody shouting something. I only heard Oswald say, I was 15 feet away. Oswald said, I protest this police brutality. He said it twice. And it was brutal. They knocked him down. They stopped him from firing. Somebody got in a firing pin in his gun and saved McDonald's life. Wow. And uh, they got him out of there. And I never understood why, but one of the cops was running in front of him with his hat off in 
in front of Oswald's face so nobody could see his face. And I, I kept thinking, what in the world does that matter? <laughs> so what happened next? Well, I found out where, I don't know how I found it out. We had people back in the office. We had people all over the place by that time. Found out where Oswald had lived. So they gave me the address, and I went there. That was probably eight or ten blocks from where he shot Tippett. And I go in, and the woman that ran the place. Now, Tippett, he was the policeman. Tippett was a policeman who was shot, and he was dead and already taken away by the time we got there. We didn't get there. It was probably 20 minutes after the shooting. Because remember, we got the call. We were to the depository building. Right. And we got there pretty fast. I went to the place on Beckley Street, West Beckley. The woman came in and I said, I'm looking for a guy named Oswald. She said, we don't have anybody. Nobody stays here by that name. And I said, now look, I know he lives here because the address was in his belongings that the police told me about. She said, well, that sounds like Mr. Lee. And he had signed in as O.H. Lee in the book. She tried to give me that book. I said, no, I think the cops are going to want that book. Yeah. Anyway, I interviewed a couple of people that lived there. And uh, like, just like everything else in this case, what she told me then certainly wasn't what she told other press people as they came along. She, she made up stories about the police coming to get him, you know, help him escape. And uh, we had to run those down, of course. I found out that what she saw, car number 11 or whatever she told me, they didn't even have one of that number, you know. But it, it was the beginning of a long weekend. Were you a witness to, uh, to Jack Ruby uh, shooting the York? I was a witness only that I was about behind about three people. In those days, the photographers had these huge cameras, heavy, heavy. So everybody was fighting for a position. I was in the basement, I was behind them, and I did not see Ruby for several seconds after they split and started shooting, you know. But you heard the shot. Yeah, I heard the okay. shot. And it was just it was just a little plink like shot. And I'd known Ruby for years. I wasn't too surprised, but never liked him. How'd you know Ruby? Well, he was at the Dallas Morning News and the Dallas Times Herald constantly. He would run little ads about three inches, one column, his strippers. And I remember he used to he used to take Tony Zoppi to lunch. He was the entertainment writer. And uh, he, he was up there twice a week anyway. So Jack Ruby owned a strip joint? Yeah, he owned a strip joint and an after-hours club out on Oakland also. But I'd seen him, I'd known him. I was probably in his club twice. One time I saw him, he would get mad and, and attack people. He knocked one guy down, I don't know what he'd done, maybe, maybe he'd touched one of the strippers or he'd made some kind of remark. Ruby took him, and he was drunk, and threw him down the stairs, and the stairs in that place were like this. They were just, it was, it was... Steep. Very steep. And the guy was hurt. He got up and wandered away, but I never forgot that. Ruby was a show-off, but later on he became helpful to me. So you were at all three of the major events, the killing of our president when he was when Lee Harvey Oswald was captured at the theater, and then when Jack Ruby uh, shot him. You were present at all right. three of those. Right. Wow. Now, I was with you not long ago. Uh, time flies. It could have been a few years ago at the uh, book depository. Uh, they turned it into a museum. Uh, they were they were honoring you that night, were they not? I don't recall. I've been there so many times. I... How old were you back then? Thirty-two. Wow. Young and hungry. Young and hungry, especially that day. <laughs> and then eat <he> breakfast. <laughs> T 
tell me about how you got involved in the Ted Bundy case. I didn't know anything about Bundy. I had a young guy work for me at Newsweek. I was a bureau chief in Houston, and Stephen Michaud was right out of college and was assigned to me, and we worked together on a couple of murder stories in Houston. And uh, then Bundy came along, and I let, I I just didn't know who, who he was. It looked like a, he was wrongly accused because of his background. He'd been a Republican uh, worker. He'd been a law student for a while. He and he was people that knew him said that couldn't be Ted. That just couldn't be. Well, by that time, uh, Stephen Michaud had uh, handed the, his trial with Newsweek went to New York and uh, came up with a publisher who was interested in Bundy. And he called so me. Michaud was a journalist. Huh? Michaud was a journalist. Michaud was a journalist. He was with me at Newsweek, and we've written probably five or six books together. And uh, he called me one day and said, Hey, so I got a call from Simon & Schuster. They want to know, they want someone to write a book about this guy. Have you heard about Ted Bundy? And I said, well, not a lot. I, I know he's from the Northwest, and I know he's a handsome dude, and he's people think he's innocent, a lot of them. Of course, in those days, the problem was that they didn't have instant touch with departments and different agencies and everything like they do today. Oh, yeah, it's, it's instantaneous communication but, today. But anyway, then, that's, you know. that started us. I said, well, let's talk to them. And we did, and uh, primarily, I think, because of my uh, work on the space program and the Kennedy assassination, that sold him uh, that I could help him do it. So that's how we got together. And then we had a problem because the average person can't just walk in the Florida State Prison. Right. You know? So I got this idea. I was a licensed private eye at that time in Texas. I did that to get access, and I thought it'd probably work in Florida too, and it did. And I got Steve and my partner signed up as a private eye also, so we could come and go. And so we spent almost 100 hours oh my with goodness. Bundy in a little old room half as big as this. What was he like to talk to? Well, at, at first, he, he was very arrogant at first, but sent Stephen in first because Stephen had been born up in the Northeast and at a young age had moved to Tacoma, Washington. And that's the same thing as Ted had done. He'd moved, his mother was in Washington area, moved to Tacoma, Washington. So they grew up together. They had Stephen that connection. And Ted. Yeah. And they knew some of the same people and it was a little uncanny really. We thought, boy, that's another plus. Now we got access. Now we got People, you know, so Stephen went in for the first half of our interviews, 30, 40 hours. We couldn't budge him. He wouldn't talk about anything, but he was innocent. And he talked about all his old buddies and what he thought in school and stuff like that. And then it was my turn to go in. And what I had with me, I had gone to Washington, Utah, Colorado, Arizona and Montana, I think, interviewing cops, testing, reporting on all the deaths that were thought to be Bundy's. So when I went in there, the jig was over because we didn't talk about his innocence, which riled him up quite a bit. He was very angry with me from day one. But, but he kept seeing you. He kept, yeah. The ego, we, we used his ego against him. And uh, I remember, I started to tell you this a little bit ago, when when Reagan was shot, he was shot by a guy that, from Texas, from Dallas. I had two daughters of teenagers then, they were in the same school he'd gone to. And I told Ted, I was with Ted that morning, and I said, you won't believe this, but let me tell you about my daughter. He said, he thought, he said, that is really 
weird to you. He said, well, I don't know whether he said, when I get out or if I can get out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get someone really famous, maybe the president's daughter or somebody. Oh, my goodness. That must have been chilling. Not really. He wouldn't go get out. But Put I mean, just to hear him room. say it. That's sick. Yeah. Yeah, Did well, he escape twice? Yeah, but that was early on when... That's before he got to Florida prison. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, his escapes were really something. He lost about 30 pounds to get out of one jail. Right. And they went up through a, a, a air vent and over and out. And the other one, he jumped out of the second story window while he was on trial. In Aspen, I have visited that courthouse. I looked. At, I saw that window he jumped yeah. out of. <laughs> it's a small courthouse. That's but uh, Bundy and I did not get along from that day on. And then he came up with an idea He, when he thought he was going to be put to death, way back, maybe 85 yeah. or 6, he uh, said, I wonder if I went to the governor and told him that I'd clear up a lot of this stuff if he'd let me live or let me live for a time anyway. I said, well, I don't know Governor Martinez, but I'll go see him for you, and I'll broach the subject if you want. He said, yeah, do that. Well, I guess he got talking to his girlfriend, who later became his wife, and uh, the next time I went to see him, he said, I never told you to do that. And I said, you son of a bitch. And I pulled up the tape and played it for him. <laughs> that was a good day. I played, he said, well, I, I I refuse. But it was that kind of, oh, it was really, having two teenage daughters and having met most of the, not most, but half a dozen to eight victims' families did something to me when, when he would act like he didn't do anything, you know. I felt sorry for him to an extent. He had a mother that didn't know that she was probably the, the cause of it all. How's that? Well, she was. She got pregnant and was not married. He was born in a unwed mother's home up in Connecticut. He never knew who his father really was. It never came up. She moved out to Tacoma with him, married a, an army cook named Johnny Bundy, and Ted thought that was his real father. When he was a teenager, 14 or 15, he was up in the attic looking through old papers, found out, no, this was not his dad. Didn't know who his dad was. But what papers, I don't know. And that knocked him for a loop. He took his dog, went up on a hill, and stayed two or three days. And he said that was the time of that just came around in my mind. And I said, well, what do you mean, came around? <laughs> he would never get too deep in his philosophy. But it, it, was, it was sort of sad in a way. He just never quite belonged. And yet he did, you know, so many murders. Now, you wrote a book about Ted Bundy. Wrote two with, with Stephen Michaud. Tell us about those. Well, the titles we, and if they're still in print. One was The Only Living Witness, and that was the first one we did. And what's the second one? Conversations? Conversations with a Killer. We wrote The Only Living Witness, and uh, it got such a claim, and we still probably had 30 hours of tapes that we hadn't even touched. I so still have my hardback. Of the only living witness that, that, that you so, gave me. So we went on and did this one then. We had so much so much left. I have a copy of the only living witness signed by the author. There you go. I do. Do you know him? Do you know this I guy? I know this guy. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's, he's a nice guy. I really like him. We ought to interview him sometime. Yeah. Oh, man, we are. It's Hugh Ainsworth. <laughs> I love you, Hugh. We've been through a lot together. Been through thick and thick. Thick and thick. Yes, we have. Let's talk about Henry Lee Lucas. How did you first become involved with Henry Lee Lucas? Oh, and I, I want to say, I'm sitting here with this pretty impressive uh, notebook of all these articles 
in all these national and world stories that Hugh Ainsworth has been involved in and has investigated and studied and written about. It's just amazing the pictures I'm looking at in here and the memories that I'm having of things that happened so many years ago. Uh, we're talking with an incredible person here, Hugh Ainsworth, journalist extraordinaire. He thinks he's just real lucky. I think he's a hard worker. I am very lucky. talented. The so harder, the harder you work, the luckier you get. That's true. That is true. Opportunities open. Now we got a picture with Hugh a while ago with uh, this article. How many pages was this? Hugh? Four, six? Four, I think. Four full page newspaper articles. This article came out, it hit the Dallas Times Herald about the second day of our grand jury, I believe. Yeah, April 14th, 1985. April was a busy, busy month, 1985. Yeah. I'll never forget that month. But I remember when we sat down in front of Henry Lucas and opened up your newspaper article for him and showed it to him. And he started going over the dates and looking back and forth between the dates and everything. And looked up and grinned and said, well, I was wondering when somebody would get wise to this. Yeah. Well, he had told Hugh about it way back in the beginning. And Hugh had been working on this article all the time. And it just happened to dovetail with what we were doing in Waco with the, the grand jury. And Hugh was a huge resource for us uh, during the Henry Lee Lucas. I don't think jury. that your grand jury was Convinced by me, really. You don't think they were what? Convinced. Convinced. Well, you know. I told them, I said, in a couple of three days, we're going to do this big uh -huh. story. Yeah, they had but to wait and see. that was a lot for them to, to swallow. It was a lot for them to swallow. You know, we were talking a while ago about how on the Kennedy assassination, there are so many conspiracy theories out there about all the other ways he might have been killed and that Lee Harvey didn't do it, Lee Harvey was set up and all that. Yet on Henry Lee Lucas, it seems everybody wants to believe Henry did it. Where are the conspiracy theories here? Thank you for listening to the Vic Fazell Show podcast. And visit us at www.vicfazell.com for more information. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Drive late back and lower your speed. One eight seven seven with thick.